that is one of the things that, that my work points at is coming up with appropriate ways that highlight the ways that democratic schools are uniquely positioned to provide mm. for the psychological well-being, which is typically not a measure that's taken in schools. Um, Very difficult to measure, yeah. That's the thing, is, is that it's actually not that difficult. Uh, <laughs> um, but people don't know that yet. <laughs> they, it used to be. Yeah, in a sense, if you, if you know what you're doing, it's easy to measure. So I would argue that based on some of the horrific things that were happening at the special school, and my children were before we started at Delanta, that I would say that the inspection if anything, has absolutely no regard for the psychological yeah. well-being and development of my children because my son was literally for 18 months to two years stagnated and mm. was incredibly unhappy. And I, you know, I tried doing everything I possibly could. I was organizing meetings, doing everything I could to get something to shift. I had I had a very good relationship with a lot of the teachers there because I was, you know, in a sense, I was the Dutch word for it is a betrokker ouder which means, you know, a pushy parent, you might say, we're putting it, but as a special needs parent, you become a bit like that, you know, you're, you're, you know, you you have a a different role to to a regular parent in that sense. And I had a really good relationship with the teachers and so on there. And in fact, the teacher said, you know, I think your, if your son's just not a school person, he's very introverted. He knows what he likes to do. And if he doesn't want to do it, he won't do it. And there's nothing we can do about it. Mm-hmm. They knew that there was nothing wrong with him in that sense. Supposedly, he has that autism and ADHD, which he does. I have autism and ADHD too. I can see that in a classroom situation, he would fall under the table in the regular school. He was mm. When he was five years old, he would basically go under the table and he would basically slide around on the floor. He wasn't hurting anybody necessarily, but it wasn't an ideal situation when you've got 35-year-olds or six-year-olds that you want to teach. You've got to drill this bit of math into this these and, and if he's just like making origami Pokemons and giving them to people and having fun, that is not what they want to do. He was an extreme case of a child who maybe it was his upbringing, maybe it was his genes, I have no idea. But he he didn't do something if he didn't want to. Right, right. He was, he's, he's very, very clear about who he is. I'd like to take credit for that. I don't know if I can. I, <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it was me, but... It was exactly what you didn't want to have in a school in the sense where a school takes your identity. You need to be whatever they want you to be in the class. And he just wasn't capable of being that person. In the field of psychology, we've really realized that, in general, situations are more determinative of behavior. However, there are these exceptions. (laughs) Disposition uh, matters Mm -hmm. a lot under certain (laughs) circumstances. In, In your son's case, it's an internal circumstance in the sense that his brain is wired in some way that made that very clear to him that they're like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to do this yeah. because that's how he was wired. Now, I suspect as he grows older, he'll become more sensitive to situational cues and things like that because that's well, I think he is learning. now. Yeah. yeah, he's getting, as he gets older, he's, um, he is in a sense more self-aware and aware of other people's behaviors in that sense. But I think I remember thinking when he was 18 months, two years old, that compared to his older brother, it was like he was on a balloon and at any Mm. point he could just float off. He had Mm. his, he had this ability to just bubble himself. Mm. And if you asked, if you told him not to do something, he would go, but just do it anyway. Right, right, right. My, my, my parents used to call me, she who will not be told. Because mm-hmm. I always had an answer for everything. And I think it was it's very similar to that. It was just sort of like, you know, he, I think he had, a, he's got quite a good relationship to self-preservation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In fact, I had a conversation with my other son about this, about this idea that this, the self-preservation that you naturally have as a human being is I think sometimes corrupted by school or by if you're if you're molecule of if you have if you're protected too much because I remember as a Gen Xer growing up also as a single parent family where my dad didn't really have much idea what I was doing as a teenager mm. that he made it very clear to me that I'm not qualified to tell you what to do in life mm. which is quite quite an odd thing even for Gen X generation to have a parent that will just say well I am not qualified to tell you what to do in life. Mm-hmm. It's up to mm-hmm. you. And so as a result, I became 
much more responsible and self-aware. For example, if I went to parties and things, I knew I had to get myself home. Yeah. And and so whereas my friends were having more problems with alcohol and drugs, for example, not to say that I didn't do them, but um, I knew I had to get myself home. Right. And so my sense of self-preservation was much stronger. And I think that um, Ruben has got, even though he does his own thing, he has got a very healthy sense of self-preservation. Mm. But it's not based on what he's told to do. It's based on what he thinks. This is the Agentic Schools podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world, where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg.